Chapter 361, Professional Gamer Are These the Friends You Mentioned? The man obviously did not want to talk about how he ended up in prison as he immediately changed the topic. Yes, let me introduce you to them. Brother Assist first introduced his mercenary mates. Given how famous each of them was, any gamer would feel the need to express their shock when each of their names was mentioned, and this man was no exception. Even Oathless Soar learned something new from this introduction. He got to learn that young Master Han was actually drinking addict, the legendary strategist that had always accompanied Sword Demon in many MMOs. Oathless Sword could not help but be surprised once more since he was also a renowned expert by his right. Brother Assist proceeded to introduce Oathless Sword and Gale Force after the four. In comparison, Gale Force and Oathless Sword were mere landlords of a small village. Compared to the identities of Sword Demon, Royal God Call, and the rest, who were the equivalent of famous martial arts families, such as Nangong, Zimin, Bigong, or Dongfang Wan, that were well respected throughout the land. These two's names were barely worth remembering. Finally, Brother Assist introduced everyone to the man currently stuck in a cell without much fanfare. This is my friend. All of you should have heard of his IGN, Southern Lone Blade. The ensuing reaction encapsulated the difference between the famed Marshall families and Lane Lords. When the four great experts heard that this man was one of the five unyielding experts, all of them merely hummed, oh, largely nonchalant of the fact that they were now able to put a face to the name. Oathless Sword, on the other hand, looked so excited that he might just undress himself and jump into the dungeon to commiserate with the man over his misfortune. Career experts like him love to rub shoulders with all sorts of MMO experts. Why else would he think of following Young Master's Elite when he heard that they were off to visit someone? Upon learning that this man was actually one of the esteemed five unyielding experts, Oathless Sword had an even stronger wish to inveigle and befriend this person. Although he knew deep down that Southern Lone Blade might already have quite the substantial achievements here in Lin Shui City and inviting him to Yanjuan City would be nigh impossible, he still thought that it was a good idea to make his acquaintance. Who knew if an opportunity to form a sort of 28 Guild Alliance might come one day? And even if they might not have any opportunities to cooperate with one another in the future, he could at least still brag to others over a couple of drinks that he was pretty chummy with an unyielding expert. There was plenty of value in that as well. With that thought in his mind, Oathless Sword quickly squatted down and tried his best to reach his arm for a handshake with the man. Southern Lone Blade was pretty gracious himself. Although he was in discomfort standing in the water like that, he did not snob his proffered hand. He even apologetically said, Sorry about my wet hand. It'll dry after a shake of hands. Oathless Sword grips that hand tightly, almost lifting Southern Lone Blade up. There's something that I need your help with this time. Oathless Sword went straight to the point and was ready to let this man whom he just met know about his quest. This largely stemmed from his clear understanding on how to deal and interact with other people. Southern Lone Blade would find it somewhat difficult to reject his request when in front of Brother Assist and the others who would naturally help him convince this expert to aid them. There was no guarantee that this man would lend a helping hand if Oathless Sword sought him privately later. Southern Lone Blade was wondering why the man was so enthusiastic in greeting him, but he immediately understood the reason behind this when the man said that he had a request to make. Thus, without further questions, he promptly nodded his head. Speak freely. Was your equipment stolen? We need to act quickly if that's the case. Um, what are you talking about? Oathless Sword was starting to doubt his ears, as Southern Lone Blade's words seemed entirely irrelevant to his plight. So your equipment wasn't stolen? There's no rush, then. How much money did they take from you? I'll return you the sum if I have enough on me, Southern Lone Blade said. Oathless Sword floundered in his cluelessness. He turned to regard Brother Assist with a look of puzzlement even as his grip on Southern Lone Blade's hand loosened slightly. With furrowed brows, Brother Assist tasked on Oathless Sword's behalf, what are you talking about? Southern Lone Blade froze up. Glancing at Oathless Sword, he gingerly asked, so, you didn't get robbed while you were being ferried over? Robbed? No. Oathless Sword shook his head vigorously. Ahem. In that case, let's just forget what I just said. Southern Lone Blade coughed. The others already had an inkling of what he was talking about, though. Sword Demon knitted his brows and asked, What do you do for a living? I, 
I'm a professional gamer. Southern Lone Blade lifted his head to look Sword Demon straight in the eye. Sword Demon was a famous MMO expert, so any player who bothered to research him would know about his personality. Southern Lone Blade was aware of Sword Demon being an upright and righteous leader in many MMOs in the past, which was rare among gamers. While he was not one to hate people who did despicable acts, Southern Lone Blade would not put it past this man to reject any association with players doing unscrupulous activities. Everyone got clued in on the fact that Southern Lone Blade firmly fell into this gray area from his momentary loss of confidence in his words. He might be a professional gamer, but the business he was involved with was most likely a shady one. Strictly speaking, this act of farming other players for equipment was not a foreign sight in MMOs. Now that the gaming industry had developed into the various aspects of profession, production, and organization, the lucrativity of these businesses had also allowed the dark side of gaming to flourish. Most gamers did not really care much about this matter as long as they were not the victims themselves. Some might even seek to befriend such people so as to prevent themselves from becoming their targets. MMOs were never breeding grounds for noble and righteous heroes. Even someone as upright as Sword Demon would probably not be too displeased meeting such scoundrels were he not a victim of their predation in parallel world. Figurative sparks had already come Come alive from that stare Southern Lone Blade and Sword Demon shared, but Brother Assist was quick to smooth things out. With a hand across Oathless Sword's shoulder, he laughed loudly. We're passing by while on a mission. This friend right here is the guild leader who hired us. Since you're familiar with the lay of the land here, he is hoping that you may be able to lend us a hand. During his introduction before, Brother Assist only mentioned everyone's name. So Southern Lone Blade did not know of the position Oathless Sword held. Oh, that's why you're here. Southern Lone Blade was quick on the uptake and shifted his gaze from that staring contest as he once more looked straight at Oathless Sword. That's no problem. We'll make contact once I'm out of here. Do not hesitate to ask for my help. Thank you very much. Oathless Sword was precisely the sort that cared not for the goodness of any player. As long as the said people were not having any designs on himself or his guild, they could easily become friends. Oathless Sword would even become sworn brothers with Southern Lone Blade now that he was willing to lend him a hand. Oh, yes. Didn't you say that you have a juggernaut of a man to introduce me to? It's not any of these guys, is it? Brother Assist had only introduced the six men by their names. He knew who young Master Han was the moment he mentioned the moniker Drinking Addict. Seeing how Brother Assist introduced everyone equally, it was clear that none of them was the special guest he was expecting. Hey! Brother Assist laughed dryly. You may have already met that person. Eh? Southern Lone Blade was confused. He's the video mage, Brother Assist confessed. That guy who caused me to be sent into prison? Southern Lone Blade was very agitated. The sound of the stirring water was proof of this. I'm afraid so. Brother Assist glanced at his companions, and everyone agreed with his assessment. Let's put it behind us since we're all friends. Brother Assist began to appeal for a goofe. MHM. Southern Lone Blade hummed in the affirmative. Everyone was quite surprised to see him agree so easily. In that case, We'll be leaving. We'll discuss the matter further after you're out. How long are you in for? Brother Assist asked. Four hours. Southern Lone Blade answered. All right, we'll take our leave first, then. Brother Assist was prepared to lead everyone away. Sword Demon turned out to be the quickest to leave without a hint of hesitation. Brother Assist was actually worried something unpleasant might happen if they stayed any longer. So he hurriedly expressed his wish to leave. Oathless Sword was the only one who showed any sort of reluctance. Nevertheless, since everyone he knew was about to leave, it would be far too shameless for him to stay here with this man that he just met. Guild Leader Oathless, you don't mind talking to him alone about your guild's quest, right? Brother Assist asked Oathless Sword the moment they stepped out of the prison. Yeah, no problem. Thanks. Oathless Sword nodded his head with appreciation. Oh and, he's a standard professional gamer, so if he thinks that the matter is somewhat difficult to accomplish, he may seek payment for his services. I can't really help you on that end, either, after all, a man has to eat. I hope you won't mind. Brother Assist added. I understand perfectly. It's no problem. Oathless Sword did not seem to mind this in the least. That's all for now, then. 
brother assist bid Oathless Sword farewell for the other members of Young Master's Elite. Sword Demon's expression was still somewhat conflicted, finally asking brother assist after the five of them walked quite a distance. Just what exactly does your friend do, anyway? Brother Assist seemed to have already anticipated this question. All I know is that he has always been a professional gamer. I have no idea this is the particular scope of work he is doing here in Parallel World. There were plenty of professional gamers out there. There were the hard-working gold farmers, the more capable cell swords, and the business attuned individuals that focused on trades and resale. Some focused on one aspect of the business while others did them all. These were considered to be the more honest forms of professional gaming. Besides these, there were also the professional gamers who dabbled in the darker side of things, such as farming equipment drops from players. There were other fraudulent activities that infiltrated all those above mentioned, with even hackers in the early days. However, with the increased security awareness and subsequent measures set up, this particular brand of work no longer existed. However, a new despicable way to make a living was actually born from this fully immersive Vermo. According to the rumors through the grapevine, there was a very primitive service industry in some cities. It was a particularly undesirable line of work that plenty of people supported, especially the men. It was said that this industry alone was enough to create a tourism frenzy in game. Sword Demon found Southern Lone Blade's profession to be abhorrent at the moment but he was a friend of Brother Assist. It took erudition to know how to stand by their principles without damaging the interpersonal relationships forged. Sword Demon was at a loss over what he should do as the five men quietly continued on their way. This continued until they passed by a random tavern and saw the sudden disappearance of young Master Han. When the other four realized it, they decided to attend to their businesses and bid one another goodbye. Chapter 362 the double doors of the Bounty Assignment Hall Gufe got online a bit earlier the next day, hoping to fully erase his park value this time. Everyone from Yeonju on City was expected to rendezvous at 7 p.m. today to resume the expedition. He might feel some reservation participating if a PvP ensued like before with his high park value, so he decided to erase some of it to lessen his burden. He made his way to Lin Shui City's Bounty Assignment Hall but he slowed down his steps near the establishment's entrance. His intuition told him that someone nearby was watching him. The Bounty Assignment Hall of Lin Shui City was quite near the street when the local players sell their goods and wares. Those players who had set up stalls on Peddler's Street extended their area of operation all the way to the hall, causing the place to bustle with activity with all the people about. Gufe was unable to pinpoint who was eyeing him but he was positive that the person was doing it on purpose. The passing glance of people was entirely different from the focused attention that he was sensing right now. The latter was what Gufe meant when he said killing intent, while the former was far too brief and imperceptible for him to notice. Gufe could still feel someone's eyes on him, it was unlikely for the person to know that Gufe could sense his presence. He had experienced such bold surveillance countless times before. Thieves and stealth were often the most brazen and were usually the ones involved in this sort of task. Unfortunately for Gufe, he had no way to accurately spot the person in such a crowded avenue. This was why he had suddenly halted his footsteps and pretended to browse the items on display in a nearby stall even as his mind raced. He was certain that the person watching him had ill intention. If this person was looking for him for something mundane, there was absolutely no need for them to observe his every movement while in stealth. All the person had to do was approach and greet him. While it was quite difficult to guess who this person was, he could easily tell their intention. The robbers in this city had even branched out to do their job out in the open waters, so how much safer could he be while on land? Gufe reckoned this person could perhaps just be one of those pirates from yesterday that had stubbornly stuck with their mark and were currently waiting for a chance to strike. Surely. It was no coincidence for the entrance to the hall to be monitored like this. It was even possible that the opposing party had positioned their men to wait for Gufe's appearance, expecting him to come and clear off his rather stupendous park value. Considering that no men had been positioned like this yesterday, could this group have been patiently waiting for his reappearance for this entire day? That was truly some perseverance. Still, Gufe had been squatting in this one spot for quite a while now. 
so why was it that the person watching him was still in that same direction? Were they planning to take him down with just that one man? They were truly looking down on him if that was the case. Maybe the lone person watching him was just a lookout, and the real ambush was right at the place where he must reach, inside the bounty assignment hall. Goofy mulled this over as he glanced at the double doors of the hall. Those doors were such a familiar sight. They were shut tightly just like how they always were. Goofy silently stared at them for quite some time, yet not a soul step out. Goofy was very well acquainted with those double doors. Noticing just how unusually few the players entering and exiting them, he was even more suspicious that something was amiss. However, just like the saying a skilled man would be daring, once Goofy ascertained that there would be a sort of ambush awaiting him behind those doors, he mentally prepared himself and purposefully walked toward the hall. He was really curious on what sort of stunt the bunch of men had up their sleeves. Upon reaching the entrance, Goofy reached out to grab the door handle. Since the hall had double doors, his arm reached out to push the left door open until midway. His body had only taken half a step into the building as his right hand firmly gripped his sword that ran horizontally across his body in a small sword pose. This pose allowed him to most efficiently unleash his attack, be it a slash, stab, cleave, flick, or even a spell, in any particular direction. It was a pose that Goofy had invented himself that he felt was very suitable for this vermo. The moment to step crossed the transom, he could already feel the killing intent thickening, especially on his right side. There was absolutely nobody there, yet the killing intent was intense. He of course knew that the killing intent was coming from a thief in stealth who was hurling himself straight at him right now. Having already prepared for this, his right leg flashed out the moment his left foot planted itself firmly on the ground, pushing out the right door instantly. The door flew open without much delay swinging out at the speed of at least 500 agility points. The thief that was rushing toward him had not expected this move and slammed onto the solid door with a resounding cry of agony. If there was an ambusher on the right, why would the left lack any ambusher behind it? Goofy's right leg hooked that right door back as his left arm threw the left door open until it hit the wall. The person on the left was thinking of circling around to attack when he saw the door on his side open. But how would he have known that Goofy would open the door to the point of it reached a full 180 degree? With yet another cry of agony, that man ended up pinned behind it. Naturally, this was only temporary. If a warrior decked out in strength were in Goofy's shoes, perhaps that man would die from getting pinned behind the door. Goofy knew his limits and did not even attempt to do that. Once more, he pulled that left door back to guard his left as he held Moonlit Nightfalls horizontally in his right hand. Goofy beamed. Why is it so lively here? A good number of people were inside the hall, and all of them were pretending to line up for obtaining a bounty mission. They were unaware that Goofy had been observing the hall for quite some time outside and noted that nobody had left the premise after all this while. The system assigning the bounty mission was unlike the ticketing booth for a train station that could only assign them sequentially. With no player exiting the premise after all this while, it was clear that something was up the moment Goofy stepped in and saw a bunch of players queuing up like this. The entire hall was silent after his declaration. He heard someone click his tongue, but no one came forward to help the man from behind the right door get up to his feet as that door slowly closed automatically. The thief behind the door was holding his nose as he fiercely stared at Goofy. Are you okay? Goofy asked. I don't know if the door has any attack power behind it, so did your HP get reduced? Yeah. The thief bellowed, darting toward Goofy with his daggers flashing in both hands. Another bank could be heard as the door on the right suddenly swung out, causing Goofy to shake his head. Insolent. Too insolent. For you to slam yourself into the same door twice, did you find out how much damage the door did this time around? At the same time, the thief on the left had finally made his way from behind the door, stabbing his dagger out. Goofy unexpectedly shrank back a step bringing that left door back to 45 degrees and caused the thief's dagger to plant right onto the door, instead. Once more, Goofy pushed that door outward with a bang as the thief backed off a few steps while rubbing his nose. Look, this door moves. Goofy pushed and pulled that door a few times like he was working with bellows. The two thieves were on the verge of tears. What are you waiting for? Attack. The bunch of players was finally done pretending to queue each pouncing on the mage like wolves in a valley of sheep, spells, arrows, charge, spurring meteor, 
and even the priest's holy ball were tossed toward Gufay, bombarding him. In the end, Gufay opted to retreat for another half a step and lightly pulled the door back. Gufay felt a violent shudder come through the door he was holding. He could imagine how huge the collision was, yet it remained undamaged. Meanwhile, Gufay, who was standing behind it, had yet to suffer even a bit of damage. This level of defense afforded from a mere door had actually put all the top grade items available in market currently to shame. Gu Fei released his grip of the door and leapt backward down the steps. With a wave of his backhand, an electric wall formed right in front of the entrance. At this moment, that very same door was pulled off its hinges by the angry ambushers. Gu Fei glanced to his left and right and saw the two thieves from before. The two prepared to leap out after him but ended up getting caught on the electric wall with a zap. The current arced and crackled loudly, as the man on the left convulsed so much that he could not even hold on to the dagger in his hand. Gu Fei shook his head sorrowfully. Today must be these two men's unlucky day, they just simply have no way to escape it. Thinking of this. He quickly turned to run. He had no intention of fighting it out from the start. The hall had limited space. Just a few AO spells from mages would be enough to cover the entire area. No amount of skill he possessed would let him escape such a situation. Gu Fei took a look with that push of the door to see if he could grab himself a bounty mission before fleeing. Although the two thieves suffered ample teasing by his hand. The enemies were actually positioned rather thoroughly something that was obvious just from the way the men had waited by the doors. Thus, Gu Fei did not hesitate to leave after provoking them a little. By the time electric wall subsided, Gu Fei had long disappeared turning into an unknown corner of the street. For a moment, he did not know what he should do now that he was denied from pursuing bounty mission. Grind his level by fighting monsters? It seemed he could only do that. Gu Fei pondered on this as he asked a player beside him about the location of a level 50 grinding map in Lanshui City. Level 50? The player stared at Gu Fei curiously, even furtively appraising him. Only the really strong teams out there were capable of killing monsters 10 levels higher than. Solo players would at most do three or five levels above theirs, yet this person before him was actually asking about level 50 monsters despite being alone. Just what was he thinking? Although the man felt curious of this, he did not ask him for any details. He only looked at the time and said, the boat to the level 50 grinding map has already left. You have to wait for an hour before it comes back. You need to ride a boat to go to a grinding map? Gu Fei exclaimed. Upon hearing Gu Fei's rudimentary question, this man had already suspected this mage was someone hailing from another city. This was more or less confirmed by Gu Fei's exclamation after. The man proceeded to explain patiently, haven't you noticed there's water everywhere in Lanshui City? All the grinding maps are located on the many islands around and the only way to get to them is by boarding a ferry by the harbor that does scheduled stops in every area. It's important to grasp the timing if you wish to grind here in Lanshui City. That's so troublesome, Gu Fei muttered, asking, haven't the players thought of a solution to this? Some business-minded individuals made their boats at the start, but they would often get stolen or be damaged by others. That's a given, since things like a boat can't fit into our dimensional pockets. Actually. There's always a boat in every grinding map at every hour. It isn't exactly that much of a problem as long as we players take note of the time and get used to it, which is why no one bothered to make their own watercrafts anymore. Oh. Gu Fei more or less understood the locals' feeling towards this matter. After bidding the man farewell, he quickly headed to the harbor. Since he could not get to a level 50 grinding map, he would just look for any other maps suitable for his level. As long as there was a ferry for it, he would not need to search for it. Gu Fei was suddenly reminded of a royal god call. The latter would probably have quite a good life if he stayed here. He would not need to find his way around every time he left the city, as these boats would automatically ferry him to the suitable grinding maps. The ships would also ferry him back once he was done which meant someone who had no sense of direction like a royal god call would definitely find such a service wonderfully convenient. Chapter 363, Lin Shui Harbor Gu Fei did not know where the harbor was located in this city. He had ridden a doubt to enter Lin Shui City, and even grounded it over by the beach. In his effort to escape from being surrounded en masse by the players, he did not seem to recall seeing anything that indicated they were near the harbor. Gu Fei asked around as he walked, even attracting the city guard's attention twice because of his unfamiliarity with the city's layout. However, 
since his park value was below 30 points, he could get away from them just by running far enough away, as the guards would give up on their pursuit once he managed to get some distance away. This was not exactly difficult for him to accomplish thanks to his blink skill. Gufei finally reached Lin Shui City's official harbor in this fashion. The harbor was huge, with plenty of berths. Some had ships moored at them, with players in the process of boarding them while others were devoid of both ships and players. There were some berths that had no ship stocked, yet plenty of players were waiting, hoping that the vessels would arrive soon. There were even some ships that had just left. Those players that did not make it on board in time were still angrily cursing and stomping their feet by the berth. This was an appropriate scene for a harbor, so Gufei was not bothered by this. What actually surprised him was that the place was not only a harbor, but also a huge bazaar. The blue skies against the crystal clear water, the light sea breeze that brought forth the light sea spray, the pristine white beach. Everything next to the harbor was clearly marked out into various zones. The left had obviously been converted into a trading area. Plenty of players had set up their stalls and were fully utilizing their most readily available resource, sand. Everyone had used the sand to form mounds into various strange and intriguing shapes and styles placing the items they were selling on them in an effort to attract the attention of prospective buyers. One of the most amazing merchants had actually sculpted out life-sized human figures from the sand and adorned them with equipment and weapons. While the stats for these items were not visible, just these items being on full display like that drew quite a crowd. This man had quite the brisk business, as the equipment these sand models wore was quickly getting sold replaced by new equipment every now and then. That player was forming more even human sand sculptures whenever he had the time between sales. The other merchants around the man could only watch with envy at his ingenious idea, yet they had no means of copying him. It was apparent that the man doing the modeling had used a special technique or skill to make his models. Many of them wanted to learn it, yet they simply did not know what the trick to it was. While trade was the focus on the left, the right side of this beach had transformed into an area for leisurely pursuits. There were plenty of round tables and wooden stools sitting around the beach, which were of course not placed without a reason. It was actually an open-air bar that a player had opened, with a barkeep by the counter selling alcohol to the players passing by. This was clearly a better way to operate a bar and earn money from it, compared to Ray's bar. Ray invested quite a lot in leasing a spacious building from the system and paid a hefty amount to apply for a business permit to operate the business. This meant the system would make a record of the business and would proceed to take a cut from the daily turnover, an amount that all the players had taken to calling a tax. Meanwhile, the system was truly despicable taking the player's ridicule as a source of pride instead of shame. Seeing that there were more and more players who were starting up businesses, it actually began to evaluate the amount of tax it collected from these merchants every day. It even went as far as to create a daily search for the star taxpayer, and allocating the appropriate reward for it. These rewards were very extravagant, and the greed of some of these merchants overcame them, competing by undercutting the other players and playing the markets creating a whole murky mess of questionable practices within the in-game economy. Of course, there were various benefits for opening a business officially, like how Ray's bar had. For example, Ray would be able to send a short message to call the guards on a player that refused to pay for their liquor. After all, his business was under the care of the system, so the system could easily investigate the existence of such transactions and would not simply consider Ray's words alone. However, now that the boss had the ability to call for help like this, it was entirely possible for the summoned guards to indiscriminately arrest those players who were being treated to a drink or two by their friends, as well. Compared to Ray, these players before him did not pay any sort of tax to the system, so they were naturally not under the system's protection. What could these bar owners do if some powerful players were to wine and dine in their establishments for free? Even if these business owners were peerless experts, they could simply not afford to offend an entire guild of players. Gufei admired the scene for a bit, even as he worried on behalf of the bosses in charge. However, when he drew near and saw the sign by the bar counter, he finally understood how this worked. None of the open-air bars that operated without the system's protection were owned by just one player, 
but were opened under the auspices of a guild. Each of these open-air bars had the name of the guild they belonged to displayed in the most conspicuous place in their bars to deter any potential wrongdoers. If any player dared to eat a free meal off of them with the threat of an entire guild hunting them down, they were free to do so. There were plenty of people passing time by these bars which lent a far different feeling to things than that room Gu Fei and his fellow mercenaries frequented back in Yanju on city. Gu Fei found everything a novelty as he strolled by and took in the sights, momentarily forgetting about his original intention to grind monsters. He began to look around for an empty seat, hoping to experience this for himself. This action was spotted by an experienced barkeep, who rushed over as quickly as if he were stealing a boss. Bro, are you looking for a place to rest? Yes. Gu Fei nodded his head. This way please, there's still a seat over here. How many are you expecting? The man asked. Just me alone, he replied. Big Ben, I've got one man. Get him a table. The barkeep shouted, coming. A warrior that had been squatting beside a liquor shelf stood up and made his over. With a heave, he reached into his dimensional pocket and pulled out a round table the size of a small nightstand before casually grabbing a stool from the side and placing it down properly. Sit down. How much can you carry? Gu Fei stared in shock as he sat down. The warrior laughed thickly as he retreated back to his position to play with the sand. Bro, what are you ordering? The server extended a hand and actually passed him a liquor menu. Gu Fei looked through the list. The liquor was still the same few types normally offered, but the price listed was more expensive than the price that the system registered Ray's bar had. It seemed like the place was not merely selling the liquor alone, but the atmosphere as well. Gu Fei sighed in his heart as he snuck a glance at the surrounding players to see what they were drinking. In that one glance. Gu Fei realized that the player's take on expenditures in Parallel World was still the same, despite being in a different environment, most of the players here were still ordering the cheapest liquor available. Gu Fei was just about to do the same when he suddenly noticed there was someone sitting in a table similar to his all by himself, with two bottles of the most expensive liquor set on the table. Someone was actually drinking that sort of liquor. Gu Fei lifted his gaze and saw that it was indeed young Master Han who was sitting there drinking. While everyone present was drinking while admiring the view around them, doing their utmost to soak in the atmosphere, this man had all his attention focused on his glass of liquor alone. Excuse me. He suddenly got up. I have a friend seated over there. I'll head over and join him. Where? The server revealed a look of mild displeasure when he heard this. After all, this table had been specifically opened for Gu Fei. Over there. The player's face instantly lit up with glee when he saw where Gu Fei pointed. The man Gu Fei was pointing at was young Master Han. The liquor he had ordered was expensive and he drank quickly and in copious amounts. This sort of customer was essentially the most ideal for any bar owner. With Gu Fei actually identifying this person as a friend and heading over to help him consume the bottles, would he not drink even faster than before? The price of a glass of the finest liquor was many times more profitable than the cheapest liquor, especially since that man was drinking by the bottle. The server instantly regarded Gu Fei warmly grabbed the stool he was sitting on and placed it by young Master Han's table. Young Master Han's attention was finally drawn away from the glass of liquor he had been savoring as he turned his eyes to look at the newcomer. Seeing Gu Fei right behind that server, he did not say a word as he turned his head back and continued to haughtily imbibe his liquor. The server became suspicious, as young Master Han's attitude seemed to have treated Gu Fei as if he was nothing but hair. Gu Fei however was unfazed by this as he patted that man and instructed him, Get me a glass. He then took a seat. The man instantly searched through his dimensional pocket and took out one of the largest glasses he had on him for Gu Fei. It was so large that even young Master Han showed a slight hint of surprise. The corner of the barkeep's eyes glinted as he pleasantly patted Gu Fei's shoulder. Enjoy. Gu Fei nodded, ignoring the expression on young Master Han's face as he took that bottle of liquor and poured his glass to the brim. The size of his glass could hold almost half of the bottle in one go. So Gu Fei felt utterly satisfied when he lifted it. Before he could even take his first sip, someone appeared beside him who asked, Bro, are you interested in some grilled fish? Grilled fish? 
he was intrigued. The person replied by pointing him in a direction. Gu Fei followed his finger and saw a less picturesque part of the beach, where plenty of campfires could be seen. Smoke filled the air in that area as many players squatted before the fire busying themselves with sticks. Each stick had a fish skewered on it. The players grilled the meat and checked the side of the beach for new customers. Several of them showed regret when they saw that someone else had approached Gufe before them. My cooking proficiency is at 2,700, I guarantee that you'll be satisfied. The player continued to tout. How much is it? Um, is it just a stick or an entire fish? Gufe asked. A stick is the entire fish, the man replied but we prefer to call it a rod. Are the fish that big? Gufe was rather curious and wanted to know more. The system spawns them, so I guarantee that each fish is equally big, the man confidently assured. How much? Five gold coins. That's pretty expensive. Gufe stuck his tongue out. In truth, the food industry had not begun to develop in Yanju on city, and since they had been in a hurry to make their way through every city, Gufe did not have much of a clue about this matter so he could only express his thoughts at the price he was presented fault with. That's the market rate, the man said. Bring us two rods to have a taste, then. He said, right away. The man nodded repeatedly as he backed away and sprinted off. In no time, he came back holding two wooden rods, each with a fish skewered on it. In all honesty, it looked very rudimentary, but that particularly wild aspect seemed to add to its flavor. Gufe gazed at the fish and felt that it was visually mouth-watering. He happily paid the coins and took the fish from the man, casually lifting the other over to young Master Han. Young Master Han happened to have his glass to his lips as he slowly shook his head in response. Try it. Gufe had already taken a bite of the fish and felt it tasted pretty good, something he would highly recommend. I've already had six. Young Master Han said, pointing at the ground with his foot. Gu Fei looked down and saw the rods on the ground, exclaiming in shock, eating and drinking, you're a classic ne'er-do-well one. Young Master Han face turned ice cold as he frigidly reminded him, that liquor you're drinking is mine. Yes, yes, that's right. Gu Fei nodded his head as he took a big gulp of the drink in his hand. It was at this moment that a shout was heard. Look, it's that person. Chapter 364, A Humorous Pantomime Gufe held a rod of fish in his left hand and drank liquor from the glass in his right. He turned his head to look at the source of the shout while the liquid made its way down his throat and he munched on the fish in his hand, looking far more like a neighbor do well than young Master Han. Young Master Han also turned his head in the direction of the shout. Glancing at the man who had shouted, he looked back at Gufe. Looking for you? Probably. He replied uncaringly. Picking out a slim fish bone from between his teeth, he gently placed his drink down on the table, and then lifted his hand once more. However, he had pulled out his moonlit nightfalls now. There were only six men coming after him, so he was not worried about his safety. He was more concerned over increasing his park value, which was already at 29 points. He figured it was more difficult to make these men beat a hasty retreat than just insta-killing them. The six men had already made their way over by now. Gufe was still eating fish, but he was prepared for a fight to begin at any moment, so he was not in the least bit negligent. Unexpectedly, just as the six men were halfway to him, the two players tending the bar and setting the table intercepted them. Gentlemen, I'm sure you are all well aware of the rules? Of course, we are, the six men smiled. We are only stretching our legs, though. Surely, that doesn't violate the rules, yeah? The two players hesitated for a moment when they heard this, but eventually let them pass. Still, the two watched the six men's every move with hawkish eyes. The six players indeed headed straight to Gufe. Many of the surrounding players turned their gazes away from the scene when they noted the men's purposeful stride and the aggressive air they were exuding. Gufe and young Master Han, who had overheard the conversation between the barkeeps and the six men, made the conjecture that some unspoken rules must be in place. Since they were foreigners to Lin Chui City, they nationally did not know of these rules. However, they did not need to make a wild guess. Turning to the table with two players next to theirs, Gu Fei asked, Bro, do you know anything about the rules those guys were talking about? The two players were startled. Considering how near the approaching six men were to him right now, 
This mage was surprisingly still inquiring after something trivial instead of making his getaway. Nevertheless, despite their astonishment, the two players still explained the matter to him. Their answer was more or less in line with what young Master Han and Gu Fei had guessed. Since this was a business owned by a particular guild, the guild's protection extended beyond just preventing people from eating a free meal, but also covered preventing any sort of fights from occurring, which might affect their business. Does that mean that as long as I stay here, those guys can't do anything to me? He asked. Well, I guess so. The two are even more surprised by his question, thinking that even if this establishment was a PvP-free zone, it was still not a log-off point. In the end, just how long could he sit still here? Gu Fei relaxed when he received this answer. Stowing away his moonlit nightfalls, he picked up his drink once more and told young Master Han, It is fine. They can't act freely around here. With that, he merely took another bite out of his fish and drank another swig down. Young Master Han merely arched his eyebrow, not saying a word, and continued to sip his own drink. The six men quickly made their way over to their table. It turned out that their intention in making their way over so menacingly was to make Gu Fei turn tail and run. That way, they could give chase and leave this area, which was unofficially under the jurisdiction of a particular guild, striking once they were outside it. They had never expected him to actually remain where he was causing them to be at a loss as to what they should do as they stood by the table. They felt uncomfortable just standing there without attacking the man, but they knew that attacking the man would invite even greater trouble for them. What infuriated the six men was the pair's act of ignoring their existence, drinking and eating as they saw fit, despite them standing right beside the two. The two would even occasionally raise their heads to squint at the piercing sunlight that broke through the blue sky totally unmindful of their presence. Someone among the six finally lost his patience and addressed young Master Han, intending to get him to leave and create more pressure on Gu Fei. Hey, bro, mind if you leave, if you have nothing else to do. But I do have something here. Young Master Han remained seated, brushing off these men with his curt reply. The six men were vexed, but were unable to do anything to him. Honestly speaking, although young Master Han and Gu Fei shared a table, they could not tell if the two knew each other given how they barely spoke to one another. Right now, they seemed to be completely unrelated. Thus, these six men could only concentrate their attention to Gu Fei. Staring him down, one threateningly said, Hey, let's have a word outside. Gu Fei finished eating his first fish, so he brought the second fish to his mouth as he looked at the six men. What do we have to discuss? The six men were speechless. They were obviously not here to discuss anything, they were here to fight. Why was it that everyone they had met today seemed so tactless? This place just so happened to be a restricted area for fighting. If not for that, they would not be having so much difficulty dealing with this man right now. They were not good with their words, so when the two statements they used most often were rebutted, they found themselves at a loss for words. Let's get some more men. Anyway. We can't do anything if this guy wants to be so shameless. Since he wants to drag things out like this, let us call more men to watch this place properly, so that he can't escape even if he wants to. The six men started discussing this matter among them. Let's do that, then. The six men proceeded to call all their comrades that were still online to this area, while they neatly arranged themselves around Gu Fei's table. Witnessing this comedic pantomime made all the players around the bar laugh openly. This also displayed just how safe these players felt being on this beach. In actuality, the various guilds that had gotten themselves spots on the beach were not acting alone in their respective areas, and were actually in league, so any players would likely receive the collective wrath of several guilds if they caused a mess by the beach. Every player in Lin Shui City was made aware of the guild's determination toward their businesses after they made an example out of the first troublemaker, so no one ever dared to cause trouble in this area again. Quite some time had passed before Gu Fei finished the second draught of fish. Lifting his head to gaze at the six men, he exclaimed, Why are you guys still here? HMPH, kid. Stop pretending to be calm. There's no way you're getting out of here alive today. Someone retorted. Who says I'm not thinking of leaving? He countered. He then waved his hand to order two more sticks of fish. The fish came quickly, 
fragrant and inviting. He could hear the sound of the six men swallowing. About then young Master Han suddenly raised his head and regarded the six players. When will those guys you've called for arrive? The six men were visibly surprised when they heard this. It took them a moment to realize that the man was speaking to them. Naturally, their shock stemmed from this priest knowing their action of calling for more men. What they did not know was young Master Han was merely making a guess, but their reaction only made him more confident of his conjecture. The six men were standing there like fools, neither saying a word nor leaving. Their faces would occasionally reveal a grim determination. He reckoned that they had probably called for more helpers to prevent Gu Fei from escaping, so he casually probed them, and their expressions utterly betrayed the answer. Tell your men to hurry. Otherwise, it won't be fun," he continued. With stupid expressions on their faces, the six players wondered if he was intentionally showing false bravado, or hiding some trump card. The six hoped to get a hint from the two men's expressions, yet one merely focused on his drink while the other merely concentrated on eating his fish. They could only come to a single conclusion after this simple exchange. These two men were friends. The six men began to discuss this matter privately. This person. Could he be from Lin Shui City? I don't think so. I've never seen such a person before, someone replied. Neither have I, the others agreed. Nor have we heard about someone like him, another added. Young Master Han was of course someone people would find hard to forget, given how he looked and behaved. All it would take was a busybody catching a glimpse of him, and he would easily be well known throughout the city. This was precisely what had happened in the Anjuan city. There is a really handsome male priest in the city. Hey, have you seen him? This question was still being asked around Yanjuan city even now. No one from Lin Shui city had heard such a question before, so the six men actually came to the right conclusion, this priest was not from this city. About this time, Gu Fei finished the two fish he had recently ordered. He realized that eating six of those fish was not exactly a difficult task. The invisible hand of the system was probably at it again, tinkering with everyone's appetite to make them become big eaters in an effort to further stimulate food consumption. He had ridiculed young Master Han earlier for eating six rods of fish, so he decided to stop himself from eating more. He had finished drinking his huge glass of liquor by now while young Master Han had polished off the rest of the bottle. As such, the two of them were left with nothing to do now. No wonder he's anxious for those men to arrive, he thought to himself, as he began to look around. Just four rods of grilled fish is good enough for you? Young Master Han gazed at him. Yup. He nodded his head decisively. There was no way he would give the man something to mock him with. Young Master Han dropped the subject with his answer and turned to look at the six men again before checking the time. Meanwhile, the six men began to reveal expressions of sheer delight. Gu Fei and young Master Han followed their gazes and saw some players hurriedly making their way down from the harbor. When he saw that the two players in the lead of this procession were the two thieves he had toyed with using the doors by the bounty assignment hall, he could not help but break out into laughter. The six players simply could not make sense of why this person would laugh despite the situation he was in. He looked at six men as he laughed. What are you guys so happy about? I have yet to leave the premises. What can they do to me even if they are here? You wish to leave? The six laughed mirthlessly. Obviously, their comrades' arrival had boosted their confidence. Of course, I intend to leave. Are you guys ready? He chuckled as he stood up. The six men received a fright from his action, and hastily retreated. No one would dare make a move in this establishment, but since Gu Fei was an outsider, he might not be clear about the rules in place, and his troublesome action could implicate them. Unexpectedly, young Master Han spoke up at this moment. What's the rush? Take a seat. A? Eh? Gu Fei was nonplussed. Another bottle, please. Young Master Han told the barkeep before turning to speak at him, sit down and enjoy the show. What show? He realized that the man was probably up to something. Knowing that the people whom young Master Han toyed with usually ended up in a sorry state, he felt that it would be quite enjoyable to see these men miserable, so he sat down once more. Chapter 365 Bullying the minority with the majority A continuous stream of players ran down the city's main street to the harbor, arriving at the beach according to their respective movement speed. When the two fastest thieves first arrived, they did not make a beeline for Gu Fei. Instead, after exchanging a quick glance with the six men, 
they boldly activated their stealth right before his eyes. Using stealth was rather effective in this case, Gu Fei was currently in a busy bar by the beach and his circumstances essentially commanded everyone's attention. Therefore, plenty of people had their eyes on them as they drank. Gu Fei could sense all the players looking at him, so determining where the two thieves in stealth were hiding would not be easy at all. However, despite being in stealth, these people still did not dare to do anything to him. As such, he calmly continued watching as more and more people arrived at his and young Master Han's location. Upon closer inspection, he realized that the people making their way over were the very same people that he had seen at the Bounty Assignment Hall. It seemed this was everyone else on the opposing side. Even young Master Han felt disappointed at the sight of the paltry number of foes and shook his head. Are they all the backups you guys have? The enemies laughed coldly. Don't tell me you guys want more. Stay here and sit longer, and you'll probably get your wish. Young Master Han warmly smiled at them. Then, we'll really stay here longer. HMPH, sit tight and wait for your death, then. Although the man said this, he was actually feeling anxious inside. They were rather unsettled at the resolve the two men showed. About then many players sitting at the open air bar stood up one by one and left the premises. This entire scene gave Gu Fei and the six men a fright. Gu Fei, for his part, thought that the enemies had secretly hidden a lot of manpower and was about to flagrantly flout the rules in the area. The six men, meanwhile, felt worried that this was a ploy the two men had cooked up and received quite the scare when many players stood up in unison. However, when both parties glanced at one another, they quickly realized that the other party was as clueless as they were. It became apparent that these men's actions were not something that either side had arranged. At the same time, the players who had stood up all headed in one direction. The six Lan Shui City players quickly figured out what was going on upon seeing this and could not help but laugh. Gu Fei was still puzzled about all this, but he soon also realized what was happening. It turned out that a ship had just docked by the harbor, and these people were looking to board it to head to their grinding map. They were probably passing the time in the bar upon arriving early at the harbor. Actually, the success of the open-air bars could not just be attributed to the great seaside scenery, but also to existence of the harbor. Gu Fei's palpitating heart relaxed. But when he saw the six men not only easing up but also showing excitement, he immediately thought it a little strange. Turning his head over to young Master Han, he discovered the latter's extremely contented expression. The ship drew nearer to the harbor with every passing second. It was a ferry, but of a larger size, much larger than the Dao that he had snatched from the guards before. He did not know if a ferry should logically be that big. But the system was never one for logic to begin with. The ferry was here to service the players, anyway, so it naturally made sense that it was better for everyone if it was bigger. If it could only ferry a hundred players over, then those from Lin Shui City would surely revolt, as that was barely enough to fulfill the transportation needs of the city. The ship slowed down as it reached its berth. When the broad and long wooden plank sat down, a host of players surged forth and made their way down the beach. Gu Fei felt as if he were watching a war film the moment he saw how packed the insane crowd was. Having been ferried about for such a long time, Lin Shui City's players had already learned to let the passengers alight before they they boarded ferry. The players in the game would randomly pick a spot to sit down once they got on board anyway, so no one fought for seats and everyone maintained orderliness throughout the whole process. The crowd that had disembarked quickly scattered on the beach. Players who had acquired valuable items during their grinding headed to the right, where the trading zone was located. Those who had managed to make new friends during their grinding proceeded to the open-air bars to share a drink or two together. The entire beach burst into activity once more as plenty of merchants that sold equipment or liquor began started soliciting the potential customers. Even those players squatting at their campfires and grilling fishes began to yell words filled with descriptors unique to the game. Top quality grilled fish with a proficiency of 3,000, a rod for only four and a half gold coins, what a cheap deal. Ah, mine was more expensive. He lamented. He had bought each rod for five gold coins, and the chef only had a proficiency of 2,700. After most of the hubbub had died down, everyone got their seats. Gu Fei soon realized that more players were staring at the two of them from inside and outside the bar. Gentlemen, I believe that you are satisfied now. 
The six chuckled in delight, their friends had apparently been grinding. It was too bad that Lin Shui City's players could not call to their friends when they were off grinding levels, as they had to wait for the fairies to get them from place to place. As such, another bunch of helpers had appeared with a ship's arrival from a level 40 grinding map. Looking around, Gu Fei saw that the size of this group was not more than a level 5 mercenary group with a hundred men fleeing from these men with his blink skill should not be difficult. And if he could not shake them loose, he would just slaughter his way out. Although getting rid of a 30 park value was really troublesome, he found it really awkward not to give these people face and reciprocate after they had gone through all this effort just to kill him. Gu Fei's expression was calm as he thought of this, yet he was actually feeling elated inside at the possibility of being forced into a fight. Gu Fei had limited himself to stay below a 30 park value. But of course he was rather bothered by this limit. To break this limit he had given himself, he had to have a sufficient reason for doing so. Young Master Han, who had actually been looking at the new enemies had arrived, nodded his head approvingly, that's quite a lot. How is it? Are you satisfied? The man goaded. Honestly, not really, young Master Han said as he slowly got up. In any case, I am a very considerate person, you guys are trying to bully the minority with the majority right? I'll leave you guys extremely satisfied. He then raised his arm and waved. Everyone turned to look in the direction he had waved at. A large group of players could be seen disembarking from a ship in that direction. They did not get onto the main road, head off into the city, make their way to the trading zone, grab a drink at the open air bar or even begin feasting on grilled fish. These men looked to be pondering on what they should do next. It was rarer to see a large number of players hesitate on what to do once they got off the ferry, as they would usually go over their next steps 180 times while in bar the ship. Gufe, who had also glanced at this group of players, realized that he was familiar with many of them. They were players from Yanjuan City. These people began to move in the direction the two were situated at. Weaving through the stalls scattered about with their staggering numbers was quite difficult, so they could only amble forward slowly. Nonetheless, it was still obvious that they were heading toward Gu Fei and young Master Han's current location. The six men's mouths gaped wider and wider. Those comrades who had come to help them deal with young Master Han and Gu Fei seemed to have just been splashed with cold water with the way their mouths were hanging open. Did they call for all those people? Some asked on the mercenary channel. That's impossible. The two are not from Lin Shui City, so how could they have the cloud to gather this many people? Someone refuted. Noting the size of the mob, it was at least a level 5 guild. Could it be that they are acquaintances of a boss in Lin Shui City? Someone theorized. Bullshit. Someone would have come to their aid long ago if that were the case. Only the most powerful guilds in Lin Shui City were able to set up stalls in this guild mine beside the harbor. If the two were affiliated with a large guild, they would naturally open up a bar over here as well. After all, there were not that many level 5 guilds in every city. These men had discovered a few things about the two so far, and one of those was that the two were foreigners and did not have any strong backer in Lin Shui City. That was why they were brave enough to surround the two in one of the busiest locations in the city and were unwilling to believe that their targets actually had the capacity to mobilize such a large number of players to their cause. Could they be faking it? Someone still held on to such a hopeless wish. By this point, the head of the mass of players had already made his way over and was waving back toward young Master Han in a wanton manner. You guys aren't leaving yet? Young Master Han asked emotionlessly as he stared at the six men who were rooted to the spot. The six men looked at one another. They had come to accost the two so brazenly, and would now be beating a hasty retreat. Was this not just too humiliating? Many players had also been watching them all this while, yet, while prideful players would consider the loss of levels to be negligible over the loss of face, practical players like them would consider the loss of levels to be more important than the loss of face or potential benefits. Besides, they had the old adage, wise men will not pick a fight when the odds are against them as an excuse. Typing this on the mercenary channel. They all departed despondently from the area. Discouraging enemies from engaging is highest form of warfare one, get it? He told Gu Fei. How boring. Gu Fei felt a tinge of regret at having to keep his rule of not breaking through the 30 park value. Only after Rothless Sword reached their table did he realize that Gu Fei was present as well. He immediately expressed his delight, 
Brother Miles is here as well. That's wonderful. Gouffet was privately astonished. He had been busy with the matter involving the NPC guards, so quite some time had passed since he had any form of contact with Oathless Sword. When did he start treating me with sincerity? When did young Master Han win the mental tessel? He wondered. He regarded the crowd of players once more. Sword Demon, Royal God Call and many others had also made their way over to them. All of them were round level 40, so it was only natural for them to be on board the same ship heading to this location. Given how everyone was meeting up at the same time to continue the expedition, they would naturally end up on the same time slot. This was not at all a coincidence and was instead an inevitability. So how was everything, Boss Oathless? Is everyone present? Young Master Han asked Oathless Sword. More or less, since everyone is already online and in this city, we don't need to rush. The few missing ones should be making their way over to the harbor as we speak, there's no way for us to miss our ship. Everyone should just rest here for a bit. Oathless Sword shouted this last part to everyone present. Chapter 366 Lenshui City is an easy segment The players from Yunjuan City had suffered a huge setback in Linian City. Players from traversing four seas who had died were unable to rejoin the expedition, and although the mercenaries were expected to return, a huge portion of them had decided to back out from the mission upon realizing that there were few benefits that could be gained from participating. Nonetheless, those who had came to such a conclusion were not exactly from any sizable groups. Mercenary groups like the Black Hand, with their hundred players were still present. Therefore, although they were no longer the glorious thousand-man army of before, they still at least had numbers that were the size of a level 5 guild. Every business owner was ecstatic when they saw such a large group of players suddenly looking to rest and relax in a bar. The only problem of these bar owners was that there were not enough seats to accommodate everyone. Hearing all these people shout, Owner, do you have any available seats? Everyone who had their bars set up presently could only shed tears. It was truly a painful feeling to have such a succulent piece of meat placed before them when they had no means of eating it. Fortunately, those from Yanju on City were preparing to carry on with their expedition, so they simply had no intention of leaving the harbor just to find somewhere to sit for this short while. Not bothering to nitpick, they squeezed in at the available tables. Gufei and young Master Han's table for two was now filled with eight players. The drinks on the table were all cluttered together, as if they were having a party, and those that picked up the wrong drinks would receive a scolding from the owners of said beverages. Furthermore, their situation was still considered acceptable, since they at least had benches or stools to sit on, and a table to put their glasses on. As for the majority of the expedition, they had no choice but to sit on the sand and hold their glasses of liquor with their hands. The owners and barkeeps were naturally elated that these players did not mind the lack of seats to sit on and happily served them drinks while they apologized profusely, even going as far as to give these players a discount in their jubilation. Besides the members of Young Master's Elite, Gufei's table also had Gale Force and Oathless Sword. He was truly baffled by this and wondered when Oathless Sword began favoring and sticking to their group. When he posed this question on the mercenary channel, it was young Master Han who replied with a smirk, Didn't I already teach you the strategy of how to discourage enemies from engaging? Motherfucker, he cursed to himself, and swiftly closed the conversation window. The two leaders, young Master Han and Oathless Sword, started to converse at this point. So how did it go? Did you learn anything after meeting Southern Lone Blade yesterday? Young Master Han asked. Southern Lone Blade? One of the five unyielding experts is actually here in Lin Shui City. Gu Fei was surprised. Everyone turned to eye him strangely. Do you all know him? Gu Fei continued to ask. Ahem, he's my friend, Brother Assist offered. How is his skill? Gufei asked Brother Assist. Um, he is no match for you, that's for sure, Brother Assist hedged. How do you know when we have yet to cross paths? His eyes shone with anticipation. Oh, you've crossed paths before, Brother Assist informed him. Weren't you doing bounty mission last night? That person you ganged up on with the NPC guard was Southern Lone Blade. Gufei was stunned when he heard this. Of course, he had not forgotten about that person. He was simply astonished at how much of a coincidence their encounter had been. Young Master Han ignored him and merely asked Oathless Sword the same question again. Oathless Sword looked extremely excited as he happily replied, 
Brother Han, this is all thanks to your suggestion to meet such a preeminent person like Southern Lone Blade. Last night, he contacted me the moment he got out of prison and brought me to the Bounty Assignment Hall to inquire after the matter. Just as we had expected, that dog of a system indeed set a competitive quest in this city, just like in Linnean City. We got lucky this time, only a level 3 guild picked it up. After Southern Lone Blade brought me to visit the guild, all it took was a bit of cajoling and a light threat or two before the other guild willingly dropped the quest. Ha 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 ha. We sure are lucky. Does that mean that the competitive quest won't be released again? Brother Assist asked. Yes. I immediately returned to the quest hub to take a look after those guys dropped the quest and I didn't see any competitive quest related to ours come up. I even assigned a few of my men to watch the board and shifts, and they said that nothing come up. Oathless Sword replied in satisfaction. Doesn't that mean we're getting through this stage without much difficulty? Everyone found this a little hard to believe. Of course. Oathless Sword said as he raised his leg to step on someone's foot. Nothing happened to us after we brought this person to grind with us the whole day, right? Ha 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 ha. Oathless Sword's detestable arrogance would show whenever he was pleased with himself. The other six men did not bother to respond to him and just hide the person he had stomped on, realizing that it was actually the NPC Todd. Weren't you being a little too bold, bordering on carelessness? to bring Todd along while you guys grinded? Brother Assist asked. I was originally planning to test the waters, but the more I tested, the safer it felt. At least, we are now certain that no one in Lin Shui City appears to be targeting us. Oathless Sword became more and more spirited as he continued, Actually, those guys that picked up the competitive quest were just an average level 3 guild, I doubt they have enough manpower to pose any threat to us like Deepwater's guild did in Linnean City. Wait, if some people actually picked up a quest against towers, why did nothing happen to us the moment we arrived in this city yesterday? Brother Assist found this strange. I should be because of this city's unique terrain, young Master Han explained. We boarded the system-operated ferry to get here, so even if the opponents were informed of our arrival, what can they do to stop the big ship we were riding on? Once we reached the harbor, they would be committing suicide if they tried to wage a large-scale PvP here, given that this location is where all the strongest entities in Lin Shui City are gathered. There is only a short distance between the harbor and the city, and the prison is nearby as well. When would they find the opportunity to strike? What an accurate analysis from Brother Han! Oathless Sword jovially praised. After a moment, he checked the time and furled his brows. Looks like it's about time for us to board the ship, brothers. It's about time for us to leave. Standing up, Oathless Sword gave a hail shout to everybody. The players from Yunjuan City that were sitting on the sand echoed his shout and got up. Under the watchful gazes of many Lin Shui City's players, Oathless Sword felt really cool when he did this and wished to say a few more words, but since they would simply be boarding a ship and there was no need to mobilize anything, he ended up yelling this line, cheers and get ready to board the ship. Everybody raised their glasses, finished their drinks at one go, and started to walk toward the berth by the harbor. All had been informed which berth to go to. We are leaving already? But it's not seven yet. Gufei said. We don't have a choice. This city's ferry service waits for no man. Brother Assist patted him. This particular ship ferried players from Lin Shui City and had already docked at the berth but it did not have any passengers on board. This was not a strange phenomenon, though. Given that there was hardly any traffic between the cities and parallel world, business for this particular route could not compare with that of those that were heading to the various grinding maps. Players queued up and paid the fee to the NPC attendant before boarding the ship. Gufei checked out the crow's nest and the cabin and saw that NPCs were stationed in both. Yunjuan City's players seemed to have traveled on ships like this many times already, showing familiarity with the ship's layout and immediately gathered themselves accordingly to their guilds and mercenary groups across the deck as they busy themselves with drinking, relaxing, and playing cards. Some even brought grilled fish on board from the beach. This was the first time Gu Fei had boarded a ferry. Recalling that Zizi Ocean and Vast Lushness should also be riding a ferry for the first time just like him, since they had arrived at the city together, he made it a point to search for them among the crowd. However, there were really too many people around, so it was difficult to look for them. What he could confirm was that the two were online, 
so they should be on this ship as well. Seeing that they were nowhere near him, Gu Fei did not continue his search, he was too lazy to fire off a message to ask for their location on the ship, so he just casually found a seat and sat down. Everyone managed to board the ship without a hitch, and after ten minutes or so, the ship began to leave the shore. Gu Fei heard Oathless Sword starting to brag at this moment. Ha ha. So how is it? Perfectly planned, right? We won't be holding up anyone's time. Oathless Sword was actually saying these boastful words to his sweetheart, mercenary leader Gu Xiaosheng. Can you shut your mouth? Gu Xiaosheng said as she turned her head away from him in annoyance. Gu Fei reflexively laughed when Oathless Sword immediately shut up turning from the swaggering leader of a large guild into someone indistinguishable from the masses. Over on the sandy beach of Linshui City, a man stood upright with a shield slung over his back, a long sword fastened at his waist, and his arms folded before his broad chest. He quietly watched the ferry slowly sail out of the harbor. The azure blue water lapped at his feet, yet he did not seem to feel this. Nearby patrons of the bustling open-air bars over by the beach would point at him from time to time. Big South. Several players came running toward this lone figure at this moment. Southern Lone Blade turn around slowly. The six players behind him were considered the best among his comrades. Have you confirmed his identity? Someone asked. It's the video mage. Southern Lone Blade replied. What equipment is he wearing? Another asked. It was just as the information we gathered. No one we sent was able to appraise him, he replied. High grade equipment, then? Must be. That explains why there is such a huge reward for him. However, someone hesitated, he's a friend of your friend. Friendship is friendship, business is business, Southern Lone Blade drawled. Why didn't we strike when they were still here? A man asked. Are you insane? Didn't you see how many men were with him? Southern Lone Blade countered. What do we do now? Hitch a ride off the next ferry and follow them to the next stop, he replied, adding, that should be their final stop, so no matter if they fail or succeed in their quest, that's when these players will disband. Final stop? How do you know that? Do you have an informant in their group? Someone asked. Southern Lone Blade nodded confirmation. When did this happen? Last night. I got an overview of their situation. He replied, What you're saying is that this video mage is essentially ours for the taking. Indeed. Still, won't we be too late if we wait for the next ferry to arrive? It is the final leg of their journey, after all. They'll surely head off to complete the quest once they disembark and won't wait for the next day to accomplish the quest. Southern Lone Blade laughed when he heard this. Don't worry. There's no way they can complete the last stage of the quest easily. Chapter 367 Target, Lori City, is that a guess or a fact? One of the men asked. The final stage of games was often the hardest to accomplish, so it was common for players to make such an inference. Southern Lone Blade actually nodded his head. It's a fact. Is this from the same informant? Someone asked. No, even that informant doesn't what's in store for them for this final segment. In fact, I had only received this information the moment they left the harbor. He said, what information is that? The moment their ferry left the shore, a new mission appeared in the Hall of Mercenaries over in their next stop, Lori City, and the task for it is to assassinate the prisoner that they are escorting, he shared. Mercenary mission? Their expedition has more men than a level 5 guild. Is there any mercenary group out there that can even contend with them? One of them expressed his doubt. Southern Lone Blade laughed when he heard this. The difference is that this is a limitless competitive quest. All these players hummed with understanding. They were very familiar with mercenary missions and a limitless competitive quest had two major characteristics that was unique to it. First was that there were no particular requisites for mercenary groups picking it up, and second was that there were no restrictions on how many mercenary groups could pick it up. However, only one group could emerge victorious and claim the final prize, which was why it was tagged as competitive. This sort of missions could be considered as the most competitive kind, as it could theoretically let hundreds of mercenary groups participate. However, rules did not have a mind of their own like humans did. Whenever such uncommon missions turned up, experienced mercenary groups would not focus their efforts on fighting with one another and would, instead, 
team up with several other stronger mercenary groups to obtain the upper hand in completing the mission before splitting the rewards accordingly. With how bountiful this sort of missions was and the transparency of the listed rewards for these missions, no one was really worried that a mercenary group awarded with the completion rewards would attempt to hide anything from the others. Even if that's the case, there's no telling how many mercenary groups in Lori City will actually team up or if they can form a large enough army to contend with Yunju on City's players. Some were still worried. Don't forget Lori City's Eternal War mercenary group, Southern Lone Blade said. Eternal Dominion's mercenary group. Someone inhaled sharply. Although Eternal War was not known throughout Parallel World, the players in Lin Shui City had of course heard of that mercenary group given their proximity to Lori City. While they were uncertain of the finer details, they at least knew of Eternal War's amazing combat prowess. Rumors were abound that all the members of that mercenary group were people who knew how to fight in reality. Others said that they were just a bunch of hoodlums, some said that they were a bunch of martial arts practitioners. Finally, a few claimed that they were retired military men. Southern Lone Blade have had dealings with them before while conducting his business, and although he had no idea where these people came from, he could say for sure that their fighting skills were out of the ordinary. Actually, he had merely came into contact with a few random members of Eternal War, so he simply could not accurately gauge the strength of their group leader, Eternal Dominion who also happened to be one of the five unyielding experts. The mention of this mercenary group caused Southern Lone Blade and his few comrades to worry for Yunju on City's players, instead. With such strong opponents, there's a possibility of them getting wiped out before we even get off the ferry. That is definitely a problem. That guy has 29 park points on him. I reckon he'll lose all his equipment the moment he gets killed. Meaning, our trip over there will be wasted. Southern Lone Blade agreed. I suggest we skip the ferry altogether and just find a boat to bring us to that city. They're already far off, so I doubt they'll be able to spot us. One of them gazed at that ship that was becoming more and more obscured as it slid into the fog ahead. Yes, go call for a boat. Southern Lone Blade agreed. His comrades quickly departed from the beach. They no longer needed to stay at the harbor, since they were going to use a player made boat. No sooner that these people left, the ferry from Linian City banked in and docked by the harbor, and a string of men could be seen alighting off it. The boisterous and enthusiastic scene that greeted them at Lin Shui City's harbor caused these players to do a double take. The business owners by the harbor were perplexed as to why many outsiders were arriving at Lin Shui City over these few days. Of course, they did not intend to inquire after this matter and were merely hoping to earn a tidy sum off these players. Lin Shui City's unique leisure industry usually did very well stimulating foreigners like them to spend extravagantly. However, these players showed no interest in trying what Lin Shui City had to offer upon disembarking. Instead, they approached those people who were soliciting to customers and asked them about the schedule of the next ferry trip to Lori City. It has just departed. The next ship will set sail four hours from now. If you guys are planning to wait for that ferry, why don't you come over to our bar to rest and relax while you wait? This player that they had accosted was someone who had set up an open-air bar. He expectedly began promoting his business after answering their question without missing a beat. Do we have any other options? The person at the forefront of this group asked. There are players own little wooden boats and ferry potential customers, but since there are many of you, I'm afraid such a method may not work, the man answered as he carefully counted the players present. He was amazed when he realized that almost everyone before him were archers besides a few thieves and mages. This group composition was truly offbeat. Do we really have to wait for four hours here? The person in the lead mumbled. Deep waters. Why don't we sit here and wait? A comrade suggested. It was evident that quite a lot of them were eager to try this beach set top out. Deep waters. The eyes of the surrounding Lin Shui City players instantly shone when they heard the man's name. Could the leader of this party of archers that had come to their humble city be the top archer of Parallel World and one of the five unyielding experts? All of this was already in the past. 
though, plenty of players kept their eyes on the leaderboards and deep water's drop of level was already an open secret. Everybody was naturally curious how such a top player could be slain just like that. Now that such a larger-than-life figure had appeared in Lin Shui City, they were all craning their necks to get a glimpse of the man even as they eavesdropped on their conversation. Guess we don't have a choice but to rest here and wait for the ferry. Deep Waters shrugged helplessly as he casually chose a seat. Although he did not order a drink, he inquired after the recent matters that happened in Lin Shui City with the barkeep. Oh, that large group of players just departed from here on a ferry toward Lori City was what the barkeep said after he had asked about the expedition from Yunju on City. God damn it, just by that bit? This system is a real bitch. Intentionally staggering the departure and arrival of the ferries by a little bit and resulting in us wasting more time here, the system is really despicable. Just downright despicable. Deep waters cursed incessantly. Even if we made it here on time, do you think we could share the same ship as them? Someone reminded Deep Waters. I'm talking about how despicable the system is, are you saying that you disagree with this? Deep Waters roared. Yes, yes, it's truly despicable. People echoed. They were mostly players from Lin Shui City, though. Boss, now that you have asked all your questions, what liquor would you like to order? The barkeep asked. Liquor? Deep Water's expression turned cold instantly. I've sworn off the sauce entirely. Ask the rest of them. Deep Water and the rest of his men waited for the next ferry to arrive by the beach, while Southern Lone Blade and his comrades looked for the enterprising individuals who had made boats. As for Gufei and the rest of Yunju on City's players, they were on board the big ship and were currently sailing peacefully across the waters. The final segment of traversing Four Seas Guild Quest only required the safe delivery of Todd into Lori City's prison for it to be tagged as completed. As the leader of this guild, Oathless Sword could barely hold in his excitement. After lingering around Guzio Shang for quite some time and failing to catch even one good look his way, he carefully backed off and began to visit each mercenary group to express his thanks for them staying. Since a good portion of the mercenaries they had initially selected for this expedition backed out halfway through and returned their fees, traversing forces managed to save a significant amount of the expenses. Oathless Sword, who was currently feeling very elated, proactively promised them to increase their payment upon the completion of the quest. Most of these mercenary groups actually reacted indifferently to this. Though, honestly speaking, the reason those mercenary groups had given for dropping out spoke volumes for everyone, no mercenary group out there would be swayed by such a paltry sum into taking on such a dangerous mission. Naturally, they were all hoping to reap some unexpected benefits after taking on such a huge chain quest. Although they did meet a boss in the first part of the expedition, how would one boss be enough for over a thousand players? The few items it dropped had actually ended up in Gufei's pocket. These mercenaries barely caught a glimpse of the werewolves in the second segment, so none of them received any reward. Gufei managed to get an item off the werewolves' hands, but most people were unaware of this. If they did, they would surely feel an even greater ire toward him. It was in the third segment that their expedition came under the attacks of other players due to the existence of a competitive quest. The heavy losses these mercenaries suffered, with many of their teammates dropping a level, became the last straw that caused them to abandon the mission when they realized that no benefit or profit could be gained from this mission. The mercenary groups that remained no longer dreamed of any sort of windfall. Groups like the Black Hand only stayed to maintain their image placing importance on keeping the contract they had made. Guzio Sheng's mercenary group remained because they had an ongoing relationship with Oathless Sword and had not joined for profit to begin with. There were those that had managed to gain a lot from this mission, such as Young Master's Elite. These people were unmoved by Oathless Sword's promise of giving them more gold coins. Oathless Sword, for his part, was not really bothered by their lukewarm reaction and merely continued to wander about happily. Instead, Youthful Reflection, who was stuck in Yunju on City, was the one that expressed his worry through a message, Since we are now at the final leg of our expedition, we cannot afford to be careless. It will be a pity to fail at this point. From Lin Shui City to Lori City, half of the journey was across waters and the other half was by land. The ship sailed for about an hour and finally neared the pier on Lori City's side. The pier was still over an hour's worth of travel away from Lori City, and, Besides this ship, 
no other ferries were scheduled to arrive at this city's shore, so there was no way a beach bazaar would be present here like in Lanshui's harbor. After everyone alighted from the ship, they immediately began the next portion of their journey towards Lori City as Oathless Sword already knew which direction to go. They were not lackadaisical for this final stretch, either. Not long after they began their trek toward Lori City, someone realized that unknown people were keeping abreast with their expedition. They are players. Oathless Sword felt comforted when he got this message. He was originally worried that the system would spawn an overleveled boss for this final segment as they truly would not stand a chance if that were to happen. However, since they discovered that it was just some players skulking about, it appeared as if they were now engaged in a competitive mission just like the last two segments. Their trip to Linian City had been disastrous solely because the jungle was a specific terrain that allowed those players who specialized in guerrilla warfare to decimate their ranks. There would have been a different outcome if they had faced those Linian City's players in a direct confrontation. Given that they numbered above the average level 5 guild and that it was the final segment, there was no need for them to worry about what would come after. Hence. Oathless Sword was largely unperturbed when he thought they were up against just another competitive quest. Chapter 368, Spotting the Clue The players who shared Oathless Sword's sentiment were in the minority, as most of them were instantly on guard when they were informed other players were skulking about near them to their right. This was especially true for the mercenaries who had already lost their lives once. They were no longer expecting any sort of reward from this mission beyond the pay that Oathless Sword had promised and they were already dissatisfied with losing their level just for that small bit of gold coins. Losing a second level on top of it would truly make it unbearable. It was with that thought that caused an explosive fighting spirit to flare within them. Boss Oathless, shall we attack? We had been far too passive all this while. Now that we are at the stage, we should change that passivity into proactivity. It's better to mistakenly kill them than hesitate. Who cares what these people intend to do? Let's kill them first. Some of the more ruthless among them suggested. Oathless Sword was not someone who was the kindly and pleasant sort. He had always made decisions that prioritized his own benefit and success, even willing to sacrifice his own mercenary group if the need arose, much less these nameless passerby. Hearing the suggestions suited his own wishes, and he immediately gave the order through the guild channel. Those players that had been trailing them had maintained a certain distance as they followed. There were four groups each numbering about five or six players, all of them classes that excelled in movement speed. With such a distance between the two parties, traversing Force E's arrow formation was of course the best way to attack them. Even though they had lost half their numbers in the battle back in Linian City, the firepower they possessed was still substantial enough to contribute when it came to damage and they were definitely not insignificant by any count. These sharpshooters had always been traveling together as a pack, ready to get into formation and attack at the drop of a hat. Now that Oathless Sword had gave the order, they instantly stood their ground and got into position, turning towards their targets and drawing their bows and arrows unquestioningly. A wave of arrows came hurtling across the sky. The players that had been trekking alongside did not expect their target to suddenly attack in such a fashion. The expertise of these sharpshooters from traversing four seas really came through. In the time it took for them to get into position and fire, that group of players was barely able to react before they perished under a hail of arrows. As the white lights flashed, Oathless Sword did not care to check for survivors as he asked those sharpshooters, any of you gain park points? All the sharpshooters checked their own status window and reported back, negative. This made matters crystal clear. The lack of park points earned meant those players must have picked up a competitive quest against them which further meant the other players who had been following them also had ill intentions. Now that the morality of their actions was no longer in question, Oathless Sword was all the more unrestrained as he pulled out his Glamour and pointed towards another group of players nearby. Fire, Oathless Sword yelled out in delight, looking especially depraved to anyone who saw him. This group had been alerted when they saw the other group die moments ago, and was just about to flee but the rigorous training and expertise the arrow formation had shown through once more. They repositioned and fired off the next volley of arrows in a blink of an eye, killing off five out of the six players. That sole remaining player tried to limp away with what HP he had, but was tidied up by a casual wave of arrows from several sharpshooters. The other two groups no longer hesitated, 
dispersing and fleeing the scene. Traversing Force E's aero formation was unable to cover such a wide area, so their only option was to pick their own targets and initiate their attacks separately. Most of these players were shot down, but a handful of them managed to escape from the attack range and stared back at the players from Yeonju on City in fear. Ha ha ha, I think these guys are perhaps too careless, eh? Oathless Sword laughed to the people around him, gesturing them onward. Our enemy is too much of a noob. Could this be another small guild that took on too huge a task, just like what happened in Lin Shui City? The players around Oathless Sword laughed along with him even though they considered Oathless Sword to be far too optimistic in his thinking deep down. There were bound to be plenty of low-leveled guilds no matter what city they were in, and if the system did not have any level restriction when assigning this guild quest, it made sense that there was a higher chance of smaller guilds picking it up. At this time, the members of Young Masters Elite were also airing their own views on the matter. Brother Assist, did you manage to appraise any of them? Young Master Han asked Brother Assist. Brother Assist had run out there after that initial volley moments ago, looking a lot like paparazzi if anyone were to shove a camera into his hands. Most people would be ashamed over their low level and poor equipment but not Brother Assist. As someone that treated information gathering as keen, he was pain over his run-of-the-mill appraisal skill instead. He was no match for Sword Demon just among Young Master's elite, so he worked hard on it, such that he was able to get it to the highest level currently available, which was not a simple task to begin with. It was rare to find experts that would properly level this sort of support skill concurrently with their own level grinding at the same time. Most would prefer to focus on their actual level first, before power leveling such support skills in one go. Very few chose the same thing Brother Assist had. He had risked his life then to rush forward in an attempt to utilize his skill. It was not for naught either, since a high appraisal skill not only increased the success rate and accuracy, it even increased the range it could be activated at. Brother Assist had successfully run up and got these people within his appraisal range, consecutively using the skill twice to swiftly appraise two of them. With how quick and nimble he was in executing this, Brother Assist happily decided that this could be considered his ultimate double-shot skill. But when he returned back to the formation, he discovered that there was another person that had done the same thing he had done, whom he recognized as the Lady Will Lo from Mammoth History Birth. It was not every day that Brother Assist had a fan so naturally he would not forget that the lady was also the same type as he was. He felt rather gratified knowing he was not the only one. Young Master Han asked what he found the moment he returned back to the group. Brother Assis checked his logs and found himself stunned by what he found. Levels 33 and 32. Aren't these a little too much of a newbie? Brother Assist was puzzled. That's really low level. Everyone was even more shocked. Calling players of such level newbies would be being polite. They were more like saplings that had yet to sprout. Right now, most players were in agreement that the game only truly began upon reaching level 30. I wonder what Willow saw over on her side, Brother Assist mused. I'll ask. Gufei had also caught sight of Willow's actions when Brother Assist had rushed out just now, and figured that she must have gone to gather intel as well. Same, her results were also around the same level. Gufei did not bother to mention the actual number since it was all within that range anyhow. The mercenaries all looked at one another. Did they really luck out for this last segment of the expedition as well? Brother Assist asked. Doesn't that mean we can't earn anything? War Without Wounds pretended to be disappointed. Royal, do you see anything? Young Master Han asked Royal God Call. He was not a part of traversing Force E's arrow formation. Nor did he take potshots at the enemy when the other archers from the mercenary team realized they were attacking. He had simply stood there immobile as he stared into the distance. I didn't see a thing, Royal God Call replied. Are you sure? Young Master Han asked again. Just what are you insinuating? Royal God Call coldly spat back. Did you not even catch a glimpse of their guild emblem? Young Master Han badgered. I don't think so, Royal God Call said. Neither did I. Brother Assist was much more confident in saying that, as an information specialist, even if he failed to notice it at first glance, he at least considered it momentarily and did his due diligence. While he did not have eagle eye, he had managed to get quite near the enemy just now, and he could not recall seeing any guild emblem on those men. Shall I ask Will Lo to confirm this? 
Gouffet was also aware how important this question was. The guild emblems found in Parallel World were gifted by the system, but whether the players ended up wearing the items or not was not enforced. For example, some of the guild emblems out there were pretty ugly, like traversing four seas, so the players might not be willing to wear it. However, when some form of guild-wide mobilization occurred, everyone would make it a point of wearing them. That was because guild-level mobilizations would usually be in the hundreds. It would be difficult to be acquainted with everyone, even if they were all in the same guild, and since players would not have friendly fire protection from fellow guildmates in PvP situations, the only thing they could rely upon to identify each other would be through their shared guild emblem. Don your emblems and charge. This was a cry that all guild leader from large guilds were familiar with. They might not wear them if they were doing ranged bombardment, but once they got into a proper melee scrape, anyone who refused to wear their guild emblem would really be making things difficult for themselves. Given that so few of them were here, I'm positive they must be here to scope out the situation and had absolutely no intention of engaging in a firefight, right? So wearing an emblem or not really doesn't prove anything. Royal God Call was rather concise with his analysis. Look, none of the players from Traversing Four Seas are wearing it. This run had even learned how to give an example. What you said isn't wrong. However we can't leave ourselves open to such a possibility. As young Master Han was saying this, he had already gone to look for Oathless Sword. Not wearing emblems? Oathless Sword was experienced, immediately understanding what this statement meant as he quickly went down the same line of thinking as Royal God Call. We've yet to begin the melee engagement, so it isn't weird they have yet to don theirs. Look, even our guild has no one wearing it. That's because yours is just too damn ugly. That's why all of your men have made it a habit of only wearing it when they had no other choice left. Young Master Han ruthlessly pointed out. He he he, we've made a mockery of ourselves. Oathless Sword laughed dryly. I admit it is possible that the opponent has yet to wear theirs as well, but since we've already discovered this fact, we ought to be prepared for a different scenario. Young Master Han said plainly. Are you saying they are a mercenary group? Just a measly mercenary group that intends to conduct a competitive quest against all of us? Oathless Sword laughed. We can ignore that scenario. There's no need to prepare for that, young Master Han immediately refuted. Then what other scenarios are there? Oathless Sword was perplexed. Young Master Han did not say another word, but instead looked over towards the mercenary leader Black Forefinger of the Black Hand mercenary group. Black Forefinger was looking rather pensive after hearing what they were discussing. When he saw young Master Han throwing a glance over to him, he nodded in agreement and said, is Brother Han here suggesting this could be a limitless competitive mission? Young Master Han nodded his head. This. Even though Oathless Sword was mainly in charge of his guild, it was Youthful Reflection who was the one in charge when it came to matters regarding their mercenary group. Despite this, he was not completely unaware of something as huge as this matter, from his expression alone, he seemed to finally realize just how scary this sort of mission could be. In that case, we could be in real trouble. Oathless Sword's tone had already changed. Not too much trouble, actually, young Master Han smiled. At least it isn't a limitless skilled competitive quest. Chapter 369 The Tiger Blocking the Road Oathless Sword immediately ordered the whole company of players from Yunju on City to slow down before gathering all the various leaders to inform them of the discovery they had made. Limitless Competitive Mission all the various mercenary leaders muttered this phrase. Most of them did not have any particular experience with this sort of mission, so they seemed a little envious now that it was mentioned. But this isn't a guarantee. Gu Ziyoujing said. Perhaps they are just a guild that simply did not wear their emblems. Ziyoujing, you share the same sentiment as me again, Oathless Sword said emotionally. What nonsense do you mean, again? Gu Ziyoujing exploded. This is the situation at hand right now. Young Master Han ignored their exchange and continued, We've already confirmed that our opponent this time is surely on a competitive quest, with us as the target. There is no need for any elaborate plans if it is just a single mercenary group. If they are just a single guild, the four players we appraised were only around level 32. May I ask everyone present if any of you are aware of a large guild that would accept players that had just made it to level 30? Everybody nodded in agreement when they heard this point. Using Traversing Four Seas as an example, they were a large guild that had already gotten to level 5, 
and the median level of their members was around level 40. Guilds that were a little off their standard would usually have mostly level 37 and level 38 players as members. They had long considered players around level 30 to be nothing more than newbies, so no large guild would even accept such low-leveled applicants. What Brother Han here means is that no matter if our opponent is a single mercenary group or a guild, we would have no problems, contending with either. Thus, what we should be anxious about is the possibility of a scenario where we're actually the target of a limitless competitive quest, Oathless Sword said. Young Master Han nodded his head. In that case, those guys we killed moments ago are likely the stragglers and general fighter, the true strength our opponent possesses has yet to appear, Oathless Sword said. If we are truly up against a limitless competitive quest, then we must truly get a better understanding of those noteworthy mercenary groups that call Lori City as their home. Guild leader Rothless, I'm sure you've done your homework on this, right? Young Master Han asked. Of course. Oathless Sword's expression turned somber when he said this. Speaking of mercenary groups, there is indeed an extremely renowned mercenary group, called Eternal War, in Lori City. The leader is none other than Eternal Dominion, who also happens to be one of the five unyielding experts. This Eternal War mercenary group essentially holds a position far greater than the strongest guild in the city, Fallen Leaves returning to Roots, something entirely improbable in any other capital city. Such power. Everybody was somewhat alarmed by this. After all, the difference in the number of players between a mercenary group and a guild was entirely lopsided, so how strong would each member of the mercenary group have to be for them to possess the strength necessary to, to suppress the strongest guild in a city? More importantly, everyone believed that the strongest mercenary group in every capital city had to be around the same level, so for Eternal War to actually dominate the strongest guild like that. Traversing four seas would most likely be similarly overrun. Oathless Sword continued to elaborate on everything he understood about this mercenary group. The most unique characteristic Eternal War possesses is the fact that fighters comprise the majority of their members. Fighters as the majority. Everyone was absolutely astonished when they heard this information. The fighter job class was largely regarded as the weakest out of all the available job classes during the open beta. Even though the situation changed after the official launch, the newer players that joined did not have enough time to make their way to the lead positions in terms of levels, which explained why there were so few fighters among the high-level experts. This also meant most players did not have too much experience when taking on fighters with some even never having engaged in PvP with that class at all. It should not be a coincidence that they have so many fighters on their side. Is there anything strange about this mercenary group? Luoluo asked. MHM, rumor has it that all the people in this mercenary group are well versed in combat in real life, while others say they are just a bunch of hoodlums. Some even claim they originate from a martial arts hall, and then there were people who said they were ex-military. Oathless Sword's information was basically the same as what Southern Lone Blade knew. Everybody looked at one another. None of them had any idea how to deal with this sort of opponent at the moment. Just as they were stumped, the players in front sent a message over. Someone was blocking the road ahead. Protect Todd. Oathless Sword yelled out immediately, before taking the lead to head towards the front of the company even as he began to relay his orders, how and in which direction the arrow formation engage how the thieves should disengage, the positioning of the priests, how the mages and warriors should coordinate themselves, as well as delegating the various tasks and bearings the mercenary groups should take, and so on. Oathless Sword sent out a series of orders in one go, but the further he walked to the front, he realized every single person he had given orders to were looking at him strangely. Finally, Oathless Sword made it to the front of the company and saw the people obstructing their advancement and instantly understood why his men were all looking at him incredulously. There were only five players. There were actually only five players blocking the players of Yunjuan City from continuing forward. Oathless Sword's grand orders in organization of the entire company in the face of only five men shocked all of his men. The arrow formation of traversing four seas was already in position and ready. When they saw their guild leader had made his way to the front, they immediately sent a message asking, Guild leader, do we attack straight away? Oathless Sword swept his gaze over the five men before him. Four were fighters, while one was a warrior, 
he had already guessed where these people hailed from, which meant their decision to consider this a limitless competitive mission was an accurate assessment. Await my orders, Oathless Sword replied to the sharpshooters, as he stepped forth from the crowd and stared at the five men. The five of them were calm and composed. Oathless Sword had no idea if it was his mind playing tricks on him but he felt like the casual air of the five men standing before him was particularly imposing at the moment. Oathless Sword finally spoke up, could the five gentlemen before me be members of Lori City's Eternal War Mercenary Group? To think our foreign visitors here could also tell who we are, someone from within the five calmly replied. To what do I owe this pleasure? This question of his was clearly redundant. Mission, that man replied concisely. With just the five of you? Oathless Sword looked all around vigilantly, feeling there must surely be some sort of ambush in place somewhere. No matter how strong someone was, it was too much of a joke to expect the five of them to be able to take down the hundreds of people here. We wouldn't dare, that man answered. The five of us are just here to greet our opponent, at the same time hoping to let our distinguished gentlemen here experience the skill we possess in person, so that you could all mentally prepare yourselves. Oh? Oathless Sword raised his eyebrow when he heard this. And how would we experience it? It's very simple, really. Randomly pick out a few men from your people and spar a few rounds with our buddy here, that man said. And what if we win? What if we lose? Oathless Sword said. The purpose of this is for you guys to have a better understanding of our prowess. The outcome of the match is unimportant, can you guys even win? That man's words were wildly arrogant but his tone and demeanor was not in the least bit boastful. I'll volunteer. Gale Force could no longer hold back, and leapt forward from the company. It was too late for Oathless Sword to stop him, since Gale Force strode out to charge at the opponent. Oathless Sword decided to let this go, and to use this opportunity to see what was the deal behind this rumored well-versed in combat. While Gale Force looked particularly aggressive with his one charge, he did not use all of his power intending to accelerate even further when he got closer to the enemy so as to unsettle the enemy with a sudden burst of speed. The person he was hoping to target was the second person from the left, the same man that had been talking all this while. When the others saw Gale Force dash out like that, they figured Gale Force would surely be at a disadvantage, seeing as there were five men who could be his opponent. Before Oathless Sword even gave the order, the players who were close to Gale Force had also jumped out prepared to lend a hand. But even though the opponent had five men, only a single one stepped out to trade blows, and it just so happened to be the person Gale Force had hoped to attack. This man began his assault even before Gale Force made it to him, similarly striding out just like Gale Force did. Hi. Once Gale Force saw that the distance between them was about right, he took two rapid steps forward suddenly and activated his spurring meteor making him even faster. The expression of the man changed ever so slightly before he stood firm and twisted his body to the side almost instantly. Even though the direction of Spurring Meteor's trajectory could not be changed once activated, it was still possible to change where the fist was going, so Gale Force hurriedly extended his arm, looking to score a hit the moment the man twisted to the side. But his punch looked to have been seen through by the opponent. Before his fist could even connect, the man had already squatted down and swept his leg out. Gale Force's blow did not connect, but the opponent's leg sweep caught him, embarrassing him as it forced one of his legs to collapse into a kneel. His spurring meteor had yet to end, yet his opponent had already interrupted him with that leg sweep, clearly showing that the sweep superseded his spurring meteor. That sweep should be considered a basic attack, had this fighter actually added stat points towards strength. Not many people picked the fighter job class, so the discussion about stat distribution for the job class was very limited, as well. Most agreed that agility and spirit should be the focus. The strength and weakness of any job class was in its skills, so no one dared to challenge the world with basic attacks. The damage fighters dealt from their skills were not anything to write home about, so while adding strength would indeed improve their damage. The strength of the job class was in its short cooldowns. The rule of most MMOs focused on the idea of enhancing strengths to make them all the more outstanding, and countless people further researched the job classes with such a line of thinking. With the system's hints and introductions, the consensus and resultant research for the job class focused upon the combo attacks unique to fighters. Such a path could improve the lack of damage fighters dealt, 
and more importantly, it was extremely cool, and so instantly became the favorite. Since then, most fighters focused on the spirit stat, and plenty of agility was also required for their combos to chain, so there were hardly any arguments against players concentrating their builds across the two stats. But Gale Force, a named fighter on the Job Class Experience leaderboard, was actually facing this non-mainstream build today. Before he could even criticize the man for his error in allocating his stats, the man had already seized that moment when Gale Force was half kneeling to bounce upright and deliver a reverse kick right to his back, instantly sending Gale Force, who had lost his equilibrium, hurtling away towards the other four men. Gale Force. Those players that had burst out from the crowd looking to lend a hand had not expected Gale Force to be sent flying in just a few moves and hurriedly brandished their weapons to mount a rescue. Chapter 370, 9 Chain Transformation After that opponent sent Gale Force flying, he did not seize the moment and follow up to land the finishing blow, allowing those men that came out to help Gale Force to rush over and protect their fellow guildmate. Gale Force looked beat up, but he knew that the actual damage done was largely insignificant. That man's sweep and reverse kick were just basic attacks having added that bit more of points and strength than the average fighter would add. In any case, it really was not too big a deal in actuality. Under the watchful gaze of the players surrounding him, Gale Force stood up and showed a sheepish expression. Oathless Sword was also deeply shocked by this. He was old buddies with Gale Force and they knew each other very well. No one was clearer than he just how capable Gale Force was and seeing this nameless grunt beat Gale Force without breaking a sweat really showed that the strength of Eternal War mercenary group was not without basis. Or perhaps, that person is actually Eternal Dominion himself, disguising himself as an underling in order to mislead us into thinking they are very strong? Oathless Sword could not help but think this, as he was simply too confident of Gale Force's skill, not wanting to believe that he had actually been soundly beaten by some rabble. With that thought, Oathless Sword's eyes darted over to the men that had run over and attracted their attention silently. Those men were all old comrades of Oathless Sword, so they immediately understood his intention as they all came forward and said together, Let us exchange pointers, before rushing forward to engage with the enemy. Their target was not just the man that had sent Gale Force flying, but the other four men standing by the side as well. Oathless Sword kept his gaze locked onto those four. He wanted to see for himself if every single one was just as indomitable, or was it just that man obfuscating the reality of things? This time, there were more players attacking as Gale Force stood rooted to the ground. Eleven players came forward, and they were all melee job classes. Each of them had split themselves accordingly as they sought out an opponent in pairs. As a large guild, they were used to using numeric superiority to bully the few. Many of them expressed disdain towards engaging in conventional one-on-one -on -one duels. Yet despite having more men on their side, the result was still unsightly. Everybody watched as those five men all demonstrated a skilled deafness in their movement and attack, they could all tell that even the warrior had added points in agility with how quickly he raised his arms. Some of the eleven men were pounded down to the ground or tripped, with others sent flying when their attacks were soundly countered. This time, those men did not limit themselves to just basic attacks like before, going as far as to unleash their skills in their attacks from time to time. For example, that warrior activated his charge, and the player he had targeted was the only one that was severely damaged in this entire sequence, unable to climb up to his feet for the longest time. The rest of them all discovered, just like Gale Force, that even though they were struck down to the ground, the damage they sustained was hardly significant so they could easily continue the battle if they intended to. Moreover, their opponents did the same as they had done when Gale Force was struck down before. None of them made the effort to finish any of these men from traversing four seas off as they stood silently where they were. Oathless Sword furrowed his brows and signaled the people fighting with his eyes once more. Aside from that heavily injured player who was still sprawled on the ground, the remaining players rushed forward to re-engage. Oathless Sword was hoping to see if his own men would be able to gain enough experience through the exchange to better contend with these men after being beaten by their opponents once. But reality was truly cruel. The men who rushed forth once more were handily defeated in a move or two yet again. Oathless Sword and the others could not bear to watch the sight, 
when he suddenly heard someone from inside their formation let out a cry. It was a gasp of pleasant surprise that made Oathless Sword entirely discontented. He immediately glared over and saw the grinning Gufe. Oathless Sword had no idea what he should say now, since he did not dare to offend the great thousand miles drunk carelessly. It was around this time a series of pained moans arose from the battle as those comrades of his were eating dirt for a second time. The enemy continued to show no intentions of dealing the finishing blows, each standing their ground steadily, like before. Oathless Sword finally understood what they meant when they said they wanted them to have a better understanding of our prowess. That was not a show of bluster or arrogance, it was the truth. Oathless Sword had a good understanding the depth of the skill they possessed right now and it was strong, very strong. His fellow core member of Traversing Four Seas, Gale Force, had been handily defeated, so how many others in this company of men were stronger than Gale Force? If this mercenary group was truly filled with men of that caliber, it would not be a flagrant life or eternal war to be capable of suppressing a guild. Oathless Sword's palms got sweaty, yet it seemed like their opponent was still waiting for them to send someone else out. Oathless Sword was no longer in the mood to send more of his men to make a mockery of themselves, so he made the decision to kill them off instead. He was about to call his archer formation to attack when Gufei actually unexpectedly stepped out the crowd, and was now slowly walking towards the five men until he was right in front of them. Oathless Sword's eyes shone once more. Gufei's prowess was also indomitable and unrestrained. This was a man who often found himself in numerically unfavorable situations, his penchant and subsequent willingness to live with a park value ranging from 20 to 30 points made him a glaring sight. Despite being a mage, Everybody knew just how unconventional this mage was whenever he bore down on his enemies with a sword slashing and cleaving at the drop of a hat. I'll let him give this a shot. If he can't handle these five men, we'll just swarm them with all five hundred of us. Let's see if they can fight a hundred to one, Oathless Sword thought to himself. Gufei had already entered the clearing, just as those men that had been thrashed got back to their feet. These comrades of Oathless Sword turned to glance at their leader saw him nodding his head ever so slightly, and instantly understood what he meant. All of them retreated and left Gufei alone in that large clearing. Just one man this time? The five opponents shouted to the host of people watching from the main body of the company, after giving Gufei a once over. No one answered, which was as good as admitting to the reality of the situation. They gave a good look at Gufei once more, before muttering with knitted brows, and he's a mage, too. It was apparent that they did not seem too interested in sparring with the mage. Gufei did not answer as he continued forward. The enemy had no intention of ganging up on Gufei like traversing four seas had done, so only a single man stepped out to receive him, the very same person who had first sent Gale Force flying with a reverse kick. Meanwhile, Gufei had actually returned the sword he had been holding in his hand all this while back into his dimensional pocket and was now approaching the challenger barehanded. What kind of stunt is he trying to pull? Royal God Call was already shouting when he saw this. They were all familiar with Gufei and were well aware that his amazing damage output was entirely due to the equipment he had on. The spells from a Gufei without his equipment were literally an embarrassment to the mage job class as whole. Royal God Call's shout was very loud but Gufei completely ignored it as he took two steps closer to the man and suddenly gave him a fist and palm salute. This action gave the man quite the shock, but Gufei's leg had already swept out towards him before he could think beyond this. This man had a listless expression when he saw that Gufei was a mage, and seeing how he had not attacked as he got closer and closer had him wondering deep down. Mages are mainly supposed to be attacking from range, Everyone knows that. That man only came back to his senses at the time Gufei made it all the way in front of him and suddenly greeted him with a salute. In the next moment, all this man saw was a leg flash by as he quickly stooped to let it brush past. He was just about to counterattack, but he did not expect that kick to change trajectory to come crashing down in the same moment he bent his body allowing the heel to land right on his neck. The man was perplexed. He was certain that this man had just done was not a single leg sweep kick, but an axe kick, so would that not mean his act of bending his body had essentially locked himself into falling victim to that kick? Just as this man was stewing in his regret, unable to understand what had caused him to make such a gross mistake, he suddenly saw a black blur in front of him. After Gufei's right leg came plummeting down on him, 
he continued his attack with a little hop from his left leg that brought his knee right towards the opponent's nose. This man subconsciously leaned backwards, but Gu Fei, who had yet to land from his hop, twisted his body in the air and was already showing his back to the man, yet his right leg landed squarely on the man's chest. This man retreated several steps after taking that blow. Gu Fei had also flown out after connecting his kick but easily landed on his feet. Someone from the five men had already cried out in his astonishment, Nine Chain Transformation? Was that the Nine Chain Transformation just now? Gu Fei chuckled, aren't you guys training the Kuo Jiao style superscript one? Once Gu Fei said this, the eyes of those five men instantly widened, because what he had just said was exactly correct. Nine transformations referred to the nine paths that their martial style advocated, each used in combination with one another, thus its namesake of nine transformations, the chain was due to how these nine paths could seamlessly mesh with one another, which allowed them to chain together. Furthermore, this style alternated the left and right leg when attacking, using either interchangeably. The full name for this particular martial technique was actually nine chain transformation of inseparable kicks which was colloquially simplified to be nine chain transformation over time. Calling it Kuo Jiao style was not a mistake either, since the nine chain transformation was considered to be the most ancient path form in this style. After the man who was kicked back by Gu Fei regained his footing, he looked at his own HP and saw that it was as good as if he had not been attacked. It made sense, since Gu Fei was still a mage in the end, so there was a limit to the amount of damage he could do with his strength. And because he was wearing equipment while Gu Fei was attacking him with his bare fist, he had no doubt that the damage from that kick alone was not enough to penetrate his defense. However, this was an analysis that was done entirely from a gamer's perspective. The exchange would have been considered his loss if they were to consider it from a martial practitioner's perspective. Mistaking that axe kick for a sweep kick in the first place. He was completely blown away that he had judged that move so erroneously given how they were two very different executions. Naturally, he was well aware that it was not a mere mistake at identifying the move but rather that the faint Gu Fei had made was simply too quick and real to him, he fell for the ruse and made it that much easier for Gu Fei to predict how he was going to dodge the attack. Any outsider would have thought that he had obediently placed his head underneath Gu Fei's boot in that attack. His cheeks flushed a deep red when he thought of this. It was their habit to immediately further evaluate what happened, had this been a real spar, to instantly expose such a vital point like this to the opponent to an axe kick that came crashing down like that, if it did not cause him to faint he would have at least blacked out for a moment. The ensuing knee to the face and a kick right to the chest. His hand held his nose while the other hand clutched his chest as he recalled the move, as if he could not hold on even just thinking about it happening. This man's more than meets the eye. He solemnly called out. But is he really using the nine chain transformation? Why does it look so different? Another man muttered, Hey hey, how can you learn kung fu by memorizing and sticking to each and every step? you gotta adapt according to the situation and the flow of combat to properly display your prowess. Gu Fei immediately admonished him. Is that so? Then allow me to pick up a few pointers from you, that person answered as he leapt out, throwing a fist out at Gu Fei's face to initiate the fight. Gu Fei dodged to the side as the man brought forth a kick with that punch, which Gu Fei avoided by taking half a step back. That man brought up his other leg for the second kick the instant the first landed to the ground. So Gu Fei retreated by another step in response. The aggression this man displayed only seemed to increase as he impatiently prepared to take another step forward. But before he even secured his footing in that first step forward, while his back foot was still in the air, he felt a gentle push on his front foot going in the direction he was stepping. This one move caused him to instantly lose his balance, and his third kick shot out, whiffing nothing but air as he fell on his back.